some respects for this hour and a half. We want to engage all of you in thinking through what we're in, talking about and then where we can take it. And so with that, I'll turn it over to Lou to talk about the book. Uh -huh. Okay. <laughs> so here's the book. You should buy it. No, you can download it. <laughs> you can download it for free for another. I've got them. I'm trying to get them to extend it to the end of the week, but they don't have. Of course, it takes Cambridge two years to make a decision, so basically. Okay, and of course, here's our conference. Okay, so really briefly, um, why Wisconsin? Um, and I want to say quickly before I say why Wisconsin, I want to say that Wisconsin is both a case which has specific relevance to the American field right now, but it's also a model for the kind of work that we're trying to do. And so there are, there's two broad reasons why Wisconsin and why a single state where this degree of contention exists. So first of all, we, Wisconsin was a laboratory of democracy uh, in, in Justice Brandeis's uh, term. Uh, it was a birthplace, birthplace of the Republican Party when it was an anti-slavery party, not a I won't say that, when it was an anti-slavery party. The rise of progressivism uh, and a seat of socialist urban mayors for uh, a good part of the 20th century. Uh, in 2010, as everyone here, almost everyone here knows, Scott Walker was elected. We saw the part of the Tea Party rise, and that led to Act 10, the so-called budget repair bill, targeting public sector workers in the form of cutting retirement, re reducing retirement, ending unionization, and so on. And we, we also believe that this is the beginning, I believe, I should not speak for all of us, I think we all do, but um, that this is the beginning of the, uh, this was the moment in American political life when that degree of contention actually became a form of governance. When Scott Walker dropped the bomb in his own term, to quote, yeah. when he dropped the bomb on his opponents, he was essentially engaging in a form of Trumpism before the fact. So Wisconsin is a battleground in that sense as well. It, it anticipated much of the contentious politics that we've seen ever since. Uh, we know about the recall, most of us, that uh, Governor Walker survived. Um, uh, but at the same time, uh, uh, the next uh, President Obama and Tammy Baldwin won the September for the first time. Uh, Walker was reelected. So it's been back and forth ever since. A blue wall state, Trump won in 2016, partly basically securing him the presidency. And Democrats then came back two years later for a variety of reasons, retook the governorship, uh, and so on. Uh, and so in 2020, Wisconsin was essential to reversing, if you will, the trend of Trumpism, but arguably it's still a battleground in which these forces are, are going back and forth and will be for some time. Um, part of our argument is that nationalization, which is a dominant theme in both political science and political communication, is, it is, of course, it's important, and, and uh, we'll speak to that throughout, but it's not the whole story. We have, uh, you know, a critical role of local television, uh, the growth of Sinclair stations in Wisconsin, although we don't have hard evidence about their effects, to be clear. But we do have clear qualitative evidence that the GOB, GOP instituted a strategy that used local television systematically in the way that the Democrats didn't. And <laughs> I can say, personally, uh, still don't quite understand that they should have, uh, that they should have a constant presence on local television. Uh, local newspapers uh, have, as most, most of us know, been consolidated in the, in the state. state. Dr. Gannett and Lee are the two, two you know, oligo oligopolies with a few other uh, ownership uh, groups and, and independents. But that, of course, has led to a shrinking of coverage, a decline of the, the relevance of local newspapers. Over the decade that we've studied, which, which these are the hubs of local, not just local news, but local communication. And of course, one of the huge questions is what, what is, how is that local communication ecology now evolving as, as tr that traditional, quote, reliable source declines? We have uh, uh, the decline of certain kinds of statewide media coverage, um, uh, the shrinking of the coverage of the state. So not only was the Walker and the GOP doing things that actually, if you look at public opinion, were, were not in favor, not against majority public opinion, but yet the reporting on those elements and the connecting of the actions they were taking to the, the actors was actually weakening and weakening and weakening, weakening consistently. In, into that void came conservative talk radio, which has played an increasingly role, uh, important role, both with Charlie Sykes, Milwaukee talk show host, 
who had a statewide presence. And this, uh, we don't know if it's unique. We've, Carrie Hughes nobly tried for a long time. We both did to figure this out. But we think that Sykes, Charlie Sykes was a, he was in Milwaukee, but he was a statewide figure. He was closely allied with Governor Walker. They actually strategized and tested themes in, in a variety of ways together. So this may be a unique element to Wisconsin, but it still either way shows the incredible important power of talk radio, conservative talk radio. And finally, social media, which of course we, you know, we uh, colleagues will talk more about in a few moments. But, but I would say, uh, but the only thing I would say about social media before we get to this, this next slide is that uh, and a number of you in this room have talked about this. We, we tend to, we focus a lot on Twitter. Why have we focused on Twitter? It's important, but we also, because we can get Twitter data. We can analyze Twitter data in our R packages. Um, and, 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 and we all know that Facebook, especially for the swing voters of the state, the median, so quote median voters, that Facebook is still, local TV and Facebook are the modal the modal media for most people. We understand least about Facebook for obvious reasons. It's behind its data wall, but we need to do more to understand that. And so this is also a plea to, to all, all of you to, 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 not, to not always go where the light is, but look for, look for where we think the most significance might be. So the battleground model, um, this is Chris and I did this on a napkin once, and then Chris, Chris made it look much better than that. Um, uh, we, we look, in, and I hope you'll recognize some of what we just, I just talked about in this model, um, but effectively the model says that uh, there are concentric circles. If, if the life world is the core of meaning, and didn't, haven't really had time to define it, I'm not going to now either, but it's the center for most people of, of their lived experience and how they make sense of the world. Uh, partly through what we're going to talk about in a few moments is conventional discourses and social networks. So social networks and conventional discourses are essential to understanding the actual analytical social structure of the life world. And within that, so these are, these are social networks, meaning distinct from social media networks. This is another you know, plea, if you will, that I have that I think hopefully, I think I can speak for all of us. Social networks and social media networks are not the same that they are not co-identical, they are not coterminous, and that people's social networks are still largely rooted in locality. Keith Hampton, who's done some of the best work on this, has showed that most people's you know, Facebook groups are essentially, you know, their grade school, high school, you know, junior high school, some camp, maybe some camp or some extracurricular experience, and then maybe if they've moved once, they sort of drag those new networks behind them. But effectively, Facebook is an aggregation of social networks, and then that becomes the infrastructural layer through which social media flows. So we still need to understand the social network structure of social life and the embeddedness of the life world in it to actually understand the real effects of social media. Finally, local media is this local layer, state regional media, which are weaker and weaker, as we've said, International media, which is, of course, where the lion's share of, of communication attention goes to, but essentially, really, in terms of political action and political decision making on the part of voters, particularly those who are least engaged, which uh, uh, I always get their, their name wrong. Is it Krupnikov and, and Barry? Krupnikov. Krupnikov. Yeah, I mean, uh, and, and uh, I think it was Aaron who pointed out, it was Aaron who pointed out yesterday that they, they, they it's certain, you think they're going to focus on these folks who are not engaged, but in fact, it's really about the engaged. So we still have very little attention to the 80% of people who actually live in this less, less engaged uh, uh, everyday space, and we think that that's a critical thing that we need to do. Um, yeah, so finally, we're looking to find a state level set of information ecologies or communication ecologies that both overlap and are distinct from national politics which highlighting the value of these multi-layer approaches. So, Chris. All right, so let me uh, take off our transition slide here to move between our theoretical framework and the data that we're about to hear about. So I'd like to direct your attention to our, one of our overarching problems, which is how individuals develop their meaning of the world out of a combination of experiences their experiences that they have, maybe I'll go back to that in one, one second, the experiences that they have in their life world, including literally the physical environment that they live in, uh, the way that the storefronts look in their town, 
uh, whether they have sidewalks on their street, uh, the condition of their physical environment, and of course also the people that, that make it up in an immediate sense and then in, in wider senses as they gain an ex uh, experience of the world and absorb meanings from the world from a variety of, of media. So how does this look if we begin to um, uh, if we begin to try to operationalize it in an analytic framework, and if we um, uh, look for specific pieces of data. So this is what I'm going to uh, introduce you to. Um, we have here some, many of the, the sort of levels of analysis that we have incorporated into the book. We haven't used every one of these sources um, in the book, although you'll find uh, a lot of them. Um, so I just want to talk that through um, a little bit. So to begin at the bottom, at the, at the micro level, we have the ability, as we have for a long time, to understand individuals' uh, characteristics, at least their self-reported characteristics um, and behaviors, through a couple of different um, resources, especially from the Marquette Law School poll, which Charles Franklin has uh, generously shared with us, as well as our own, um, our own surveys and, and panel studies um, that we've done. Moving up from the... the individual as sort of the, the, an atomistic uh, person, um, we, can, we can move up into, into larger sources of data. So first we can situate individuals at a sub-county level within the United States. First the census tract, which depending on where you live may, may range from a few blocks to, to sort of a, a, a number of blocks. Um, and there's a lot of data collected at this level because it's the census. So we know a lot about demographics there about um, income uh, and economics, some about labor, labor force participation, and those kinds, of, um, those kinds of numbers. Just a little bit larger, although unfortunately not all that well aligned uh, with census tracts, are zip codes, where you have some different collections of data. We saw the use of the RUCA codes um, earlier today and yesterday, which are mappings of population density according to zip code, so it's a convenient way to look at one aspect of the nature of the community the person is embedded in. And we also have other information about uh, voting behavior, relative deprivation, and things like that. Uh, the next level up, uh, the county is uh, a very important level of governance in the United States, so there's a lot of, uh, lot of data available there. Um, again, poverty status. Um, in, in, if you're not familiar with the United States, a lot of local government is organized here, like sheriffs, so there's some degree of um, uh, crime uh, prevention uh, there and, and things like that. Um, across all these layers, we have varying amounts of uh, media, ability to zoom in on media specifically. So sometimes you have, especially in rural areas, uh, news media are organized at a county level. You will have uh, newspapers that are rural county um, newspapers. Other times it's specific to a city but may serve, um, may serve a county. Uh, if we go one step above that, we get uh, the formalized media markets, which tend to be larger certainly than, than rural counties, but can give you a sense of, uh, of the, the, the population that is responding to a particular set of media, even if it spills across state lines. Uh, so in, the, in northwest Wisconsin, you have the Minneapolis-St. Paul uh, media market, which spills partway into uh, northwestern Wisconsin. Um, and then at the top level, uh, in, in our analysis, we have the state, which is obviously another critical uh, unit of the American political system um, with a variety of, of measures there, as well as to a significant extent, uh, media as well. So we've found, as Lou mentioned, that talk radio is partly organized along a state, uh, a state basis, although that, that's, uh, that varies a little bit based on where the individual stations uh, for talk radio are. You also see newspapers, larger newspapers uh, that are oriented, like the Wisconsin State Journal, oriented to state-level uh, analysis. So putting all that on, on a slide and, and being able to kind of organize it and, and think about it was one of the important steps that we took in this project as we're trying to integrate the possibility of thinking about how individuals live within a local community, which is embedded within larger communities, uh, which provide important streams of information. Um, and that's the, the rough mapping of uh, our conceptualization here. And next I'm going to turn it over to Devon and Mike, who are going to tell you more about the specific operationalizations that we conducted in this book. 
Thank you, Chris. I'm going to um, do a quick off-ramp into a few uh, intellectual debts and sweat equity debts <laughs> um, that I just wanted to make sure we, uh, we highlighted, uh, both for the folks uh, in the room, but also for people on the live stream or graduate students thinking about where to study. I think it's important to get a sense of how we do things. Um, and I think it's important to get a sense of um, how all of it comes together to do analyses uh, across all of the different sorts of levels you see here. And so I just wanted to briefly acknowledge our other uh, two uh, co-authors, one of whom is in the room, Kathy Kramer, uh, over there. Um, we, uh, we, uh, the, the book stands on uh, her shoulders and with respect to many insights uh, that run across the chapters and in, in terms of our uh, different sorts of uh, epistemological approaches that we debate about every Friday from 12 to 1.30. Um, and then uh, John Peavy House, who uh, is currently playing the role of Dad Taxi, uh, but uh, is, uh, was, a, was a critical uh, co-author on our book as well. Um, thanks to John. Um, I also wanted to note that uh, many of the uh, students who work with us at the CCCR played uh, co-author roles in many of the book chapters. Um, Sadie Dempsey and uh, ji Yoon Suk and Josephine Lakito were lead authors on each of our empirical chapters. Sadie's in the room. <laughs> Joe and ji Yoon are professors at Texas and UConn now, so they are not in the room. Um, and then uh, John Ng Lee, uh, Yiming Wong, uh, Zay Duan, um, Carrie Hughes, who's now across the pond at Cardiff, Jordan Foley, who's now at Washington State. Uh, who am I leaving out for others who were on the book? Um, and then, yeah, and then um, uh, another uh, member of our team uh, and part of our overall work uh, funded by the Knight Foundation, Bill Satharis. Um, a lot of his work has been critical for lots of the other talks you, you, you've seen and, and some of the conversations we'll have um, um, across the rest of the day uh, as well. Uh, we also owe uh, the Knight Foundation um, for uh, their center grant, um, the Holtz Center for helping us uh, run this conference, um, our department, uh, um, Rowan Calix and Ashley Toy, especially in terms of providing all of the food and organizing all of the hotels and the travel and all of that, and also organizing the publicity for this. And then to Mats Rudels, who's uh, having us uh, making the live stream happen as well. So <laughs> thanks to all of, 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 of these folks. Um, one thing uh, that we want to talk about is, so how do these things look over time? And so we've done uh, a collection uh, of news media data using LexisNexis and Media Cloud, also BadgerLink, also the Wisconsin State Historical Society. And we'll show you some, uh, a little bit more of how that data is arrayed in a moment. Um, we have a lot of data from Twitter that Devon will talk about. Chris and Lou have talked about the Marquette Law School poll data and our own uh, custom surveys, but as Devon mentioned at the very beginning, I'm not sure if the live stream started then or, uh, or, or not, but the one of the purposes of the Elements series is to, to lay down some markers and to say we have some work in progress that we think is a standalone piece, but also the beginning of what we hope is a lot of other work. And so um, part of what we want to do is also help you understand what's in this data to imagine what other kinds of things we might do to extend the work to try to prove us wrong um, or uh, some combination thereof. So um, all of that is to say we've thought, we've thought you know, pretty carefully about um, how we can in integrate these uh, data for our particular project. And so we have several hundred interviews uh, done across uh, the regions uh, of our state over the last several year period. Um, we have a few different panel surveys we've conducted ourselves along with the, the waves from the Marquette Law School poll data that Charles Franklin so generously shares with us. I should also note Charles generously weights our data to help make it comparable and consistent with the Marquette Law School poll data uh, as well. So thanks uh, to Charles who um, amazingly does that for, for no money, which is great. Um, goodness of his heart. <laughs> that's right, the goodness of his heart. Um, so the, the, the interviews uh, that, that uh, folks on our, our project conducted um, with uh, citizens of Wisconsin. Uh, Sadie did a lot of these in the room along with uh, Monica Sensenay Bush um, and, and others. Um, and, then, and then Lou, of course, did some. And then Lou and I also interviewed a variety of news media elites, former politicians, people in state government, uh, folks of, of that nature as well. And part of what we were seeking to do is to understand conventional discourses, which uh, come from Claudia Strauss, which is another thing I want to mention is this is the third conference we've done in the last four or five years. Each time we're bringing in people who shape our thinking. And so Claudia was a guest of us. 
and that drove us to think about conventional discourses uh, more seriously. A lot of the good things we do in the book came from learning from others uh, in, in this room and on this floor over the last couple of years. And so this involves an inductive analysis where we're trying to figure out kind of meaningful discourses and frames that are how people are making sense of their, their everyday life. And, th and, and one thing that you see in the book is that ways people make sense of their life are not always um, in the same direction. They're often contradictory. They're often contradictory in the same thought expression <laughs> that, that people share. And so it makes it interesting and, and challenging to think about what is it that people, how are people making sense uh, of, of the world around them. And so we do a lot of work on the qualitative side to figure out what are some of these conventional discourses that emerge with respect to how people talk about three issues that we think are centrally important in Wisconsin, immigration, health care, and um, what we call economic development, where the, uh, the discussion and policy behavior around the uh, Foxconn plant uh, in Wisconsin is our kind of case for uh, economic development. And so then we want to engage in a, a variety of things you can see right here on the screen in terms of doing traditional content analysis with a, a, an army of human coders, along with supervised machine learning, um, syntactically annotated dictionaries. Josephine Lakito uh, is one of the people who are pro is probably most responsible for all that is good in that section of, of what it is that we do. Um, and then we do a lot of validating with independent human coding um, and merge it in with the other kinds of time series data, including uh, analyses of major events. And so we did, we had several people engage in kind of different qualitative exercises to develop a list of major events that were related to these three issues that happened both in our state and nationally over time and went through a, a series of processes week by week to say which things should be in the event calendar and which things shouldn't or in the event timeline and are merging all of these different data together um, re ending with some computational text coding so that we can apply that to the newspaper data that we have and the social media data that we have these are just some examples from the book of what conventional discourses look like in terms of the conversations with individuals um, or small groups uh, that we had over the course of the last several years. And so, um, for example, you can, um, for, for uh, example, in the immigration chapter, uh, um, uh, a person calling Anna says, you know, I think you're not a country if you can't control your borders. Why are we letting in these bad people? If you're a good person and you have something to contribute, like intelligence, maybe you can write. You have something you can give to the promotion of this country that we built. And why are we letting in people that already are admitting that they're going to destroy it? Um, and then Leo ties it actually to another issue in our book, uh, saying bring them in here and then you give them free stuff like Obamacare. Um, this you know, ignores that you have to buy the health insurance. It's not free. Um, and I respond saying, I know it, oh my gosh, and don't get me started on all the free stuff, there's a lot of it. I mean, I don't even, these Obama phones, and you know, it goes on and on. So like these, these conversations, but you see themes drawing out of, well, there are rules. We have borders, there are rules with respect to coming into the country. There are um, elements that individuals imagine are appropriate for legal immigration, contributing to society in some way, as Anna talks about. And then there's the other side, which is, the uh, kind of the understanding of benefits that people might uh, get from the government uh, or others. You see seeds of some of, of, some of the politics of resentment from, from Kathy's own individual work in, in, in some of these as well. And then you can kind of see, you know, next to it then, how this might manifest itself in social media discussion, right? Only gullible, dumb college students call illegal immigrants dreamers. Grow up, right? So these kinds of things are kind of manifestations of the same conventional discourse, but in another, another mode. And so we have those across all of the different uh, kinds uh, of issues. We then want to understand how often and in what, you know, and where <laughs> are these conventional discourses present uh, in newspaper data. And so we have uh, collected about 380,000 plus uh, newspaper articles from around the state over the last decade or so. These are those papers. And so um, that's just kind of where that comes from. You see we get a pretty good uh, spread uh, of the state um, where these uh, papers are available from Media Cloud, LexisNexis, the State Historical Society, BadgerLink are all the places um, that you can find uh, data like these. And then we want to layer in, and let, just remind me when you want to start, and no, just, just jump keep up going, when you're ready. Going, buddy. Um, and then we want to <laughs> layer in how these conventional discourse discussions with real live humans that we can talk to and observe as examples of what happens in, in daily life in Wisconsin, with social media conversation that happens in Wisconsin, with news reporting that happens in Wisconsin's newspapers, with other kinds of factors that also affect 
that first part of the figure Lou and Chris were talking through, the, the, the affecting our own you know, li life world. And that's how local unemployment rates might change in a county, how the county is aging. So we have data across the counties for unemployment rate change, uh, percent population over 65, access to health care, um, the percentage of manufacturing jobs. So these are just examples of the kinds of structural data that Chris was talking about and kind of that micro, meso, um, macro uh, figure he was talking about. These are all data that we've used. We've used some in, in other stuff that we've published. And um, on the public opinion side, Ji and Suk is often, uh, and Jianning Li are the primary people responsible for helping us think about doing the multi-level modeling, comparing our survey data to the integration of, of all of this. I think maybe, Devon, this is a perfect time Sounds for you great. to jump in and all right. be Thank smart. All right. Thank you, Mike. Um, so, as, as uh, uh, my co-author has already covered, uh, we're trying to integrate a great deal of different data here. Um, the possibilities in this data are, frankly, quite endless. I mean, we, we, could, we could really microanalyze particular events. We could go into really great detail around particular networks. We could look at specific, uh, 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 or we could take a step back and look at things very holistically. And in the book, the approach is to do that step back and to look at really things in totality and look at two, three different dimensions. On the first level is those conventional discourses, as Mike mentioned. And those are all raw material. Rather than thinking of this as a top-down exercise where we said, okay, here are media frames and how are they adapt and how are they taken in by individuals? It's, we started with, how do people talk about these issues? What's their regular way of discussing them? And then do we see the embedding of that in social media? And ultimately, do we see those seeds planted into news media through frames? And why do we think that? Because we have growing evidence that social media drives news rather than the other way around. That journalists look to social media for the ways that they frame and talk about issues. So why wouldn't we reverse that and start to look at that in the other way? When we do that and we start to take those same conventional discourses and look at news media content for them at these different levels, it gives us the possibility to start to combine all these different discourses in ways that look, let us look at communication flows. And I want to be careful that the models we're about to show you are not causal models. They're not t they're time series models. What we're really looking at is the flow of discourse between any two elements of this media system. And it's about whether they're sharing these different conventional discourses. We're not even looking at whether or not those relationships are positive or negative. We're not even looking at which of those conventional discourses are. We're looking at the totality of the influence. How does the conventional discourses or the frames embedded in one media system shape or relate to, or ultimately maybe have a reciprocal relationship with, other elements of that same system? To do that, what we're able to do is look at every frame device in national conservative, moderate, and liberal news among the, the data we sampled, as well as national conservative radio. And what we did here was Rush Limbaugh and Sean Hannity. We could not do Charlie Sykes. We're in the process of doing that. But we relied on the markers and the discourses in national media conservative talk, thinking they would reflect what we'd see in, in local. Corresponding conventional discourses on Twitter surrounding national Wisconsin conservative elites and Wisconsin national liberal elites. We defined who the national figures were and then looked at their Twitter flows, compared the Twitter flows of people who were local conservative actors, moderate conservative actors, or local liberal actors. And that was done by Chris and I and others, hand-coded 700 different key accounts for characteristics. We did snowball sampling to determine who were the first level, the second level, who were they connected to, to establish a core of Wisconsin political elites on Twitter and then look at what they were doing apart from what was happening at the national level. That may be it for that. Um, the next is uh, uh, parallel frame devices in local news. So how much is local news sharing these particular frame devices or these conventional discourses? And ultimately looking at just how is the broader public then, outside of these elite layers, talking about these same issues? And then what is Google search volume for those same terms? So this is taking a whole lot of data and pushing it together. This is not taking into account in the next layer, we do public opinion analysis where we bring in con these contextual layers along with individual. So we're going to talk about these in two ways. One is to think about these flows. The other is to think about local context and embeddedness in the life world. What is your situation? What other factors are shaping that? So start with immigration. For us, immigration is an, an exemplar of the nationalization of political discourse. And so if we just look at the flows, what's fascinating here is there, there's not a ton of 
important discourses that flow across. The lines are not thick and that heavy. There's a certain discourses that tend to shape. But it's almost, really, the power is coming from conservative talk radio and conservative national elites who are playing the biggest role in shaping the local discourse in Wisconsin on this topic, if we can think of this as flows in that respect. And if you look at those lines down there, they're just marking the number of significant relationships. They're not talking about the direction. They're not talking about the flow of it. We're just talking about these two objects are tied to one another. If we look at what the contextual layer does in terms of actual individual opinion, so again, going to the model that Chris was sharing, we have individuals at the bottom and all these contextual layers above them, and we start to say, okay, what are these different factors that could be shaping how people think about their opinion environment with relation to immigration? What's fascinating is that as manufacturing jobs increase, and this is about a change in manufacturing jobs between this period of time, so this is a contextual variable, but a contextual change. So as situations improve between any two years, people's favoring of uh, uh, restrictive immigration policies goes down. Not surprising. But what's fascinating is as that happens, if you compare uh, by party ID, strong Republicans, independents, and Democrats, what actually happens is people move into their encampments. As situations improve, we go, okay, I need to think about what the other people say when things are bad. When things are better, I just listen to the cues from my party. I pick up on what they're saying. What about health care? Health care to us is really an example of issue ownership, and in this case by the Democratic Party, an asymmetry in terms of power, in terms of their ability to control the discourse on an issue that has big life world implications. So going back to what Lou was saying about what is our lived experience? People live health care. If you look at the conventional discourses, people talk about their access to health care, about the price of medicines. This is a daily issue for people. Immigration is something people who are farm workers experience because they know immigrants, so that they actually have a very different <laughs> perspective than a lot of conservatives would expect. But it's a more unobtrusive issue for many people. On the other hand, why did that just happen? We don't know. <laughs> okay, there we go. Um, and, and so to me, it's fascinating that on something that's a life world issue, what we have, certainly media influence, but national liberal twi Twitter elites are playing a huge role, especially in terms of the reaction it's creating from local conservative elites within Wisconsin, right? There's a kind of a bit of a battle there. Who is that national liberal elite on Twitter for Wisconsin? One person. Who is it? Tammy Baldwin. Over here, there's a half dozen major figures. There's Lance Priebus, there's Paul Ryan, there's, uh, uh, I mean, Scott Walker. It, they're reacting to her in this case. And we're talking about kind of the reactions that get produced, especially for female <laughs> political figures. A very interesting thing to potentially unpack here. Again, very little that we're seeing on Twitter search volume, but certainly some impact on uh, or some relationship with general Twitter search. What happens in terms of media use and support for the Affordable Care Act? Well, this looks like cultivation, like mainstreaming effects in cultivation, where the more people consume a certain kind of media, if you all consume conservative media, over time your attitude towards the Affordable Care Act declines. If you all consume moderate media, it kind of goes up. If you consume liberal media, it goes way up. And this happens, it closes the gap between conservatives and liberals on these issues. That even happens with talk radio. If you're a heavy talk radio, the liberals become more like the conservatives. Which is, again, kind of amazing to see how much the media environment seems to be shaping responses here among people who are cross-partisans. And then last, we have Foxconn. And, and Foxconn, I'm going to do my little uh, editorial here, so I don't know if my co-authors agree with me here. Uh, um, it's certainly, I know Lou does. <laughs> Lou's like, I've been telling you this for years. Uh, uh, the power of conservative media, and I'd say issue construction. This is almost like misinformation if we think about what Foxconn is in retrospect. They constructed an issue. It was, I mean, if you look at it in retrospect, nothing, very little of it materialized. And it's amazing to see how powerful the right-wing media system was in being able to drive this discourse. Huge part of it's conservative talk radio. And again, when we're doing all these time series models, as was mentioned, we're controlling for events. We have events built into the model. So anytime Trump's tweeting about this, he's making an announcement, that's all built into our model. We're taking that variance out when we're looking at these relationships. 
I mean, this is certainly liberal media have some <laughs> impact on general Twitter discourse. We see this strong direct line or strong direct relationship. But otherwise, what we see is tremendous power from the right wing media system. And especially from, I think, conservative talk radio, which, as we've talked about throughout the hour, and Aaron was mentioning this, others, how understudied talk radio is for us and how important it may be for us to delve into more. What do we see here? Something even, I think, more dramatic when it comes to kind of uh, 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 mainstreaming, if you will. I mean, look at what's happening to conservatives who, cons who consume, uh, 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 or Republicans who consume liberal media when it comes to their attitudes towards whether the, the state economy has gotten better. <laughs> they don't buy it. On the other hand, if you're a liberal who's been consuming conservative media, wow, the state's doing great. Like, ability to pull over partisans to the other side. Now, when we did our media modeling, we just didn't do it by media content. I mean, excuse me, by media consumption. We integrated into it the very coding of the media content we did and created multipliers with decay curves. So we said, how much of this discourse is showing up in your feed or in your news content? And let's do an effects decay to see how powerful the most recent content is relative to the oldest content. So... That's what we found in the book. It scratches the surface of what's there. And frankly, it scratches the surface of the data that is there. If you look at the first model that Mike shared with you, it is, frankly, a part of this. But this is all of the data, the data we have. Right? So we have data that include things like political advertising right, in the state. We have a whole other layers of data when it comes to things like census tract information that we have not integrated in completely. So the question becomes, where do we take this next? And with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Mike to close us out. So I'm just going to, um, uh, as we look at the county-by-county uh, county 2020 presidential results here, uh, it's just a, kind of a, we started at the beginning talking about how Wisconsin's been going back and forth and back and forth in terms of statewide election victories for Republicans and Democrats. Um, you know, it's, it's just a fascinating thing. But the, the thing I wanted to close and, and to kind of, especially for those in the room, but also uh, for those on the live stream um, who have ideas that they want to share with us, we just wanted to also give you a sense of the kinds of things we have in our data from the public opinion side as you imagine how we might push back on our own ideas, extend our own ideas, that sort of thing. And so both from 2018 uh, and in 2020, we did pre-post uh, uh, election panel studies in Wisconsin, and then we also did them in three states that aren't a part of the book. Uh, Ohio, uh, North Carolina, Michigan, Pennsylvania. Those are four states, I guess. In, in 2018, we did the four other states plus Wisconsin, and then in 2020, uh, we didn't do Ohio. We kept Michigan, Pennsylvania, North Carolina. And we also actually added Georgia um, and Minnesota for other reasons and other data. But So we have these pre-post uh, elections uh, of these folks in these kind of critical swing states, and we know um, their attitudes about national political figures, we know their attitudes about their local political figures. We also know kind of the, how can we try to measure things that Kathy tells us about that, that, that she's learning about in her data. So we ask people, how close do you feel to different kinds of groups? So uh, hunters, um, evangelical Christians, legal immigrants, uh, labor union members, uh, reporters. Uh, politicians, you know, the, these sorts of, you know, so, so different kinds of groups that might help us signify cultural understandings and different sorts of attitudes that are also related to things that Chris and Lou were talking about with respect to the politics of recognition um, and related to stuff that was a, a part of our yesterday's, you know, public panels. So we have all these attitudes about how people feel about themselves in relation to others. And my personal favorite finding that we've yet to publish in there is that in Wisconsin, Suburban Wisconsinites report feeling closer to rural Wisconsinites than rural Wisconsinites do, <laughs> right? It's an example of rural consciousness, I think, you know, from, from, a, from, a, from a public opinion um, survey collection perspective. Of it's, it's, a, it's a way of signifying an identity, even if you don't live in that particular kind of area. Um, so we have all that kind of data. We, we know about media use from, a, from about 20, 25 different sources. Um, from local to national to digital to social. We have uh, attitudes about how people use Facebook, how they use Twitter, um, how they use um, email uh, to talk about politics. We know um, the three people each of our participants talk about politics with the most. We know uh, the gender of those people uh, in 2020, and, and we know the, the racial uh, or ethnic 
characteristics of those people in 2020, and we know the partisanship of those people in both 2018 uh, and, and 2020. And so we can get a sense of who are people talking to, more homogeneous or heterogeneous groups. We have people's own estimations of the balance of their news flows and their consumption, plus the, the, the measures of how much they use all the different sources. We know about a bunch of different participation they engage in both online and offline. We know uh, measures for conspiratorial thinking. Uh, we have some measures related to um, emotions. We have some measures related to political knowledge. Um, I'm probably leaving out a few things, but those are kind of the broad things that we, we have no. Uh, yeah, oh, <laughs> we also have a, a sense of some of the cultural yes. taste. So the stuff that animated the Nam Jin's presentation uh, yesterday, so we have some, some, some rough ideas about people's cultural tastes. Uh, and, and what we want to be able to do is start to compare Wisconsin to other swing states. We have, you know, some uh, examples of how our state is similar or different than others. And w one thing that jumps out to me here, this is how much do you trust the Trump administration, large corporations, local TV, journalists in your state, and labor unions, is that what's widest? Wisconsin. Yep. Wisconsin is the most polarized uh, of, of these states in terms of their, their attitudes uh, about these different kinds of groups. Um, you know, others, you know, in terms of more or less trust in these different sorts of, of places. And so how is our state similar and different uh, to other kinds of swing states? And then just to give you an example of some others, here are urban residents, immigrants, people of other races than the participant, people of other religions than the participant, and people who live in rural areas. And you can see, first of all, you see big differences across the states between Democrats and Republicans, but then you also see differences between Wisconsin and everybody else. And these are all things that we would uh, be very excited uh, to unpack um, over uh, our time together. And so grateful to all of these folks uh, who have funded us, uh, grateful for our collaborators and our students and our students who are then just collaborators for now and forever. And um, that is, I think, a good spot for us to stop and open it up. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Okay, sure. Yeah. There, um, get you wherever we have to put it there. I think we can do it. Oh, yeah. This can go around for our questions, comments, etc. Do you want to deputize someone? Would, uh, can we have maybe McCow or, or Sadie, Sadie or someone? Or McCow? Want to just That'd be great. McCow, do you mind being the mic person? Thank you so much. Can we leave Ms. Estelle Bowen here? <laughs> exactly. So we'd love to get feedback, thoughts, reactions, comments, critiques. Uh, any and all of the above. Unbridled praise. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> That's rare, but yes, please. <laughs> exactly. Please just unbridled praise. <laughs> that, that'll come after. Uh, that's at dinner. No, there's just a question. I mean, Devon mentioned uh, cultivation in passing. And just as all of you were presenting, I was thinking, how much is this framework, how much are you thinking of it as an answer to, or what does it say to, the continued sort of minimal effects consensus that comes out of experimental research focused on individual responses to, you know, to mediated messages. Because you you paint a very different picture here, right? Especially in some of those, the exposure to liberal or conservative media slides. Yeah, I, I think I'm I'm not a big proponent of the the limited effects argument at all anymore. And in fact, I think this case in particular, I think part of what like Lou and Chris's argument is. When you start to really distill and you're looking at a case very specifically like Wisconsin and you can look at the full a a impact of the media system and look at the full communication ecology, then you start really observing some powerful effects. You can start really seeing, and it's not just effects, but powerful relationships among elements within the media system, right? Now, some of those I don't want to characterize as media effects, they're relationships. What we're seeing for opinion, I'd say, yeah, we're seeing evidence that the media can sway how people think uh, uh, about these issues, and especially when they're emerging issues like box cuts. I think if you can, it's like asking people opinion on stem cells. If they don't have an opinion before, a lot of what they encounter recently helps them construct. And this goes back to the comments that Mike was making about the the conventional discourses. I think what Sadie and, and, and Monica and, and Lou were able to unearth there was really very Zillarian. It's about a mix of considerations. People have all these different ways of talking and thinking about issues, and you talk to them, you see that. But what we see in these particular instances, like Foxconn, is when you're bombarded, you can activate those ways of thinking, and it shapes opinion, especially among people who are cross-partisan. So to me, that's evidence of some, you know, in some cases, as we saw in immigration, much less 
impact, right? So it depends. It depends on the, the context. Okay. Well, go ahead. I, I just wanted to add to that. Sure. Well, I would just respond to the other part of that, which is the cultivation part, right. which uh, the other part of our of research in our field generally is that the time element is so <laughs> restricted. Um, so we've tried to address that in a couple of ways. One is when we look at those contextual factors, we're looking at change within a community. So it's not only what people experience, but how they remember it being versus how it is. E but ev even in our book, we've got limitations in terms of how far you can go back. I would, it'd be great to go back 20 years. Sometimes that data isn't as easy to, to get a hold of. Um, at the individual level, we do have one other me measure uh, which we need to explore now with some of the 2020 data, which is we know both where a person is living when they take the survey, and they oh also yeah. are telling us the, the zip code in which they grew up. Yeah. So that gives us this other measure of not only at this moment, where are you, but kind of where did some of your formative experiences take place? But more broadly, I think the argument is we need to think, we, we you know, most often the best temporal dimension we have in our studies is a panel study with a two, two month window, right? Yeah, and that says good. that'll minimize all your effects, yeah. I would argue. Well, that's, uh, I guess I should add in 2020, we ended up doing, a, we did two waves in Wisconsin and Pennsylvania, and then we did a third wave in Wisconsin after January 6th. And so we, we grabbed a bigger sample in the beginning in Wisconsin, about 3,000 plus in the fall before the election, and then captured them two more times over the course of time. But even then, that, that, that still, so that still fits into Chris's point about it. That's still a truncated period of time compared to the overall you know, project. Right? And to the point that Risto was making earlier yesterday, which is we always study elections. These are very concentrated periods of intense activity versus all these flows are happening outside of election periods too, right? It's not like Foxconn was being discussed during election. The whole setup for it was the three years prior. And that, I mean, so again, when we think about how we unpack this, election periods and those public opinion polls give us one look into it. But really what Charles's data, and we have some other data in the book that shows kind of overtime tracking of this, it's actually quite amazing how much movement there is in public opinion uh, over time in the state of Wisconsin, partly in, in relation to this. So I don't know what Rich was going to add that, but um, one, just one last word about conventional discourse is I think that that is a, a large question in our work. So we can think of conventional discourse as being made up of meaning units that people assemble in a variety of ways from a variety of sources. Some of those, many of those probably are conversational. Now much conversation of the issues take place on social media. And, and then some of what goes into social media is coming from these flows that Devon has described. And so one of the most interesting questions for me, and this gets to the question of iteration, feedback, and so on, is where do these memes originate? How do they circulate? And what are their effects? Are they differential if they come from your sister-in-law on Facebook um, uh, or you know the media and so on? So we can't, I don't think we can get to that yet from this, at least not quantitatively, only sharing some very broad qualitative estimates. But I think that's an important question. You know, we, we quote Bakhtin in the book, um, it says, you know, which it comes from Claudia Strauss to be very clear that our, our ideas are half ours, and our, our, our ours are half ours and half someone else's, right. right? And so finding out, you know, the old advertising style, <laughs> you know, which, which ones are ours <laughs> and which are someone else's, but, but they travel in these discourse units, and we think that that's an important step towards beginning to see their circulation. Letitia. Yeah, so related to what you were talking about with the media effects or media relationship, I guess if we're not gonna call it effects, so, this is a question that I had with our MCS piece that Ji Young uh, led as well is, is like, who are these people that are identifying as liberal and watching lots of conservative media or listening to talk radio? Like, I, I find it hard to tease out the effect of that because those people have to be weird in the first place, sure. right? So what do we do about that? I think that's a great question. I mean, I think the way we handled in that piece was to, to, to really try to residualize out as much as you could of that partisan difference before we modeled the time effect. And here, uh, we're doing something similar, which is we're putting a whole ton of control variables into these models when we're looking at, say, contextual or, or the effects of media flows on their opinion. Now, does that mean that what we're looking at is an effect of the media, or is it self-selection into media consumption? 
that's why we're super careful in our language in this book, which is we're talking about relationships that we're observing. We're talking about flows of communication. I, I do think the question of who are those liberals who are consuming conservative or who are those conservatives who are consuming liberal, I think you'd be surprised by how much cross-cutting like, consumption there is, right? That we're not in echo chambers. We tend to consume I'm across, right? I'm surprised by cross, right? I'm surprised by the people that are a four on, or whatever that number was yeah. on I mean, but, media, but, right? Well, but maybe we're assuming that it's driven by partisanship. Yeah. Right? Like you're trying to make sense of this link, but perhaps the activating identity that's explaining talk radio isn't partisanship. They just happen to be Republicans. Uh, or they happen really to live in a, t- or they happen to live in a rural area where that's what you listen right. to during the so day because it's on in the afternoon in the cars. That's mm-hmm. driving it. It, yes, they also are Republican, but we're, we're trying to make sense of a. We're assuming that that identity is driving it when I it might not be. But now, I mean, now you're kind of good. talking yourself away from effects, though, mm-hmm. right? I mean, I- if this is an effect, we're talking about persuasion or opinion change in some sense. And if really what it is, is there's something else other than your partisanship that's putting you into the context of being a, cons- a conservative or a liberal media consumer as a cross-cutting uh, media person or audience member, um, we wouldn't necessarily expect that to be an effect, right? I mean, maybe that other thing besides your partisanship is a thing that naturally leads you to hold the wrong opinion on whatever this thing is, immigration, health care, whatever. I think just really quickly, like what I thought about, and I agree it's a great question that teacher's asking, but in response, like, but but Stephanie's comment made me think, I don't want to speak for Kathy, but I'll speak to my reading of her book. The party (laughs) doesn't come up that much, (laughs) right? When people are talking about their own identities and when they're talking about resentment and their rural consciousness and these things that Kathy sees emerge in, they're not talking about their partisanship. Um, I'm a political scientist and so I love talking about some partisanship, but it's it's not the only thing that, that's happening. I think it's happening for a lot of people, um, but I don't know that it's happening for everyone. And, and the last, the one step I'll take further is in some work that, that ji and I are, are working through you know, these may be weird people in, in Letitia's term in terms of what they're <laughs> using. Like, that may be right. They're also really consequential politically. They're the people who are 15, to- like, like 15 times more likely to split their ticket when they vote. You know, one in 10 of us, maybe, at most, split our ticket. Right. The, the point estimates we have on that for, like, the most heterogeneous media environment people is 50-50, whereas the people who are in the echo chambers are almost at zero. And, you know, and of course, the confidence intervals are wide because, you know, there's not a lot of those people, but they're critically important in a state like ours where 20,000 votes makes the difference one way or another. They st- they're still we- that Your issue still stands, and so you know, all the more reason to understand them better. Could I, could I, I just thought, since Letitia brought up her sister-in-law, I'm going to bring up my mother-in-law. <laughs> um, but no, seriously, my mother-in-law was a – I do think that it's, it's anecdotal, of course, but it's, it's, it is a type. She's a classical New Deal liberal. I mean, she voted Democratic all her life, probably voted Democratic up to the point that she died for Obama. But she watched Fox News. Oh, there's my dad. She sat and watched Fox News. Now, we think of Fox News here. We know what Fox News is, right? But, you know, you're a 70, 80, 50, 60-year-old person. Fox News is the most watched cable news yeah. network in America. It comes on your TV. You watch. If you're not watching hardcore primetime Hannity or that at that period it was O'Reilly, you know, it's Fox News, it's the cable network. Well, we watched her, Stacy and I, my wife, watched her become more and more conservative and starting parroting Fox News uh, views over a period of not that many years. And I'm not, you know, I could give you other examples. Now, now these folks tend to be older, they yeah. tend to be less engaged, but those are also <laughs> core voters and core swing voters. So, so you know, given what Devon and Mike have just said, th- those folks can swing an entire state. Yes. I'll just make one last comment, and that is, uh, G. Ewan just published a paper, this is with me and Doug, where we're looking at, in the 2016 election, what happens pre-post, among people who become more, in, go into a more conservative, a more liberal uh, 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 communication flow post-election. Like, so it's actually about change in your communication pre to post election like are you becoming more co- are you drifting more into a conservative uh, uh, environment among people who did that not on the liberal side but on the conservative side this is asymmetric they became those same people became less trusting of people of other nationalities people of other religions the rhetoric that came from trump in the first 60 days of his and and, and that kind of shaped the start of his presidency and so when i see things like that i go media effects 
I feel stronger saying that because I've got stronger kind of causal inference ability. Here we don't have that. So I don't want to be careful saying that, but in my gut, it's a media one. <laughs> <laughs> I know, we're live streaming. So the media effect under my mask, you can't read my lips. <laughs> so I have a, a question that I think um, this connects uh, from here back to, to Lou's talk, um, but I think it extends a little bit on what we've been talking about with these first couple of questions, which deals with this idea of the loss of collective identity. Um, and I wonder, the, the question that came up uh, to my mind initially was thinking about how, might, how do we conceptualize loss of recognition among loss of collective identity? Um, because it feels like recognition is something that derives from collective identity. So if, the, if there's a recognition crisis at the same time as we're losing identity, uh, what are we actually talking about? But I'm curious in the context of the, the book and the data, is there data that gets at this idea of a loss of collective identity? Is it something that comes up particularly in the interviews? Um, and is this something that might relate to some of these ideas about other underlying things beyond partisanship or ideological affiliation that might be driving some of the uh, of the findings that look unusual or odd or something like that. Yeah, I mean, we haven't formally analyzed that in, you know, to date, and it's not in the book. We, we, we did a few um, sets of little kind of question wording experiments in our data. Now I'm forgetting, I'm having data creep. I think it was in 2020, but it may have been in 2018, where we were asking people to tell us whether they thought the economy was getting better for the state or where they lived or for black Wisconsinites or for poor Wisconsin. Like we kind of varied the referent group. And so we can start to look at those questions in some way to see like what's the collective of the state compared to these other sorts of things. And we have some, we have some data about how people see themselves and how they trust other kinds of groups and who they feel the most close to. Um, and, and, and or most trusting of. We had, we had some questions about that as well. Um, but we haven't, we haven't touched it really. I, think, close I, to groups. I think it's an it's a excellent question. It's a critical yeah, question. Yeah, it's important. And, you know, teasing out, and this goes to Chris's talk yesterday too, teasing out identity and recognition, they're not, they're not the same. You're right, they are, they, are, they are analytic, they're closely related, but they're separate, right? Identity formation, if you will, which is another way of saying what I was talking about in the previous talk, cross-cutting affiliation or, seg or homophilous segre segregated affiliation become the, fo the foundation for social distance against which we can begin to then both identify ourselves with others or, or recognize ourselves or misrecognize ourselves to others. So the two, the two elements are, again, they're analytically separate but they're closely related as processes. And we don't, and the short answer is we don't have good answers to those questions. And one of the things Chris and I were talking about just before this conference was, and, and Mike too, um, how, do you, how do you begin to actually operationalize these questions using data? And it's, it's not, it's, it's do, we think it's, do, we hope it's doable, but we don't know. Sadie, I would uh, like to, not to put you on the spot, but do you have any thoughts about that question, given that you, certainly have any, everyone in this room did the, not in the room too, <laughs> <laughs> did, the, did the majority of the interviews? I, and you can say no. I'll have to think about it a little bit more. Okay. And then maybe we can talk about it later. Okay, all right. <laughs> <laughs> Good thought. Well done, well played. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's kind of a part of the issue. <laughs> Oh, I, 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 so for, for those at home, I think our, our, uh, our the man, uh, awesome guy, Mott's running our live stream, I think accidentally hit the emergency button on his phone, which he's also filming with, and so, yeah, so I, there is no emergency. Is, to a certain extent, this is maybe sort of a Putnam-y uh, question, right? And so maybe it's, even if it's things like social affiliation, um, if there's any of that kind of data, but particularly, I mean, I'm thinking about like a million interviews, um, and I'm sure, you know, if, if Sadie doesn't know off the top of her head, <laughs> I would imagine nobody does, right? Um, but that it's something that would would I, I would imagine not be super hidden in the way that people talk about their experiences and and the sort of makeup of the life world, right? That this is something that's going to come up, um, particularly for more well-established types of social connections, right? Things like 
um, and and over time, I mean, even things like religious attendance, stuff like that, you would think would be would be maybe a, a an aspect of it at least. Yeah, I agree. I mean, and it is there in some of the interviews, no question about it. I mean, that we can't on the spot answer because we're such careful social scientists. <laughs> uh, but I, it, it, it is there in the data. I, I'd like I'd like to get Kathy's take on this, given that we're really talking around a whole bunch of ideas that Kathy's thought about a lot, which are questions of. <laughs> Pass, like question? No, <laughs> no. You know, we can't put you on the spot. Seriously, well, because we're talking yeah. about like when you talk about resentment and you talk about people demand for recognition, they seem to go hand in hand, right? Like it's it's a demand to say, look at what I've been going through that you haven't been paying attention to. And and I'm wondering, like, is that the other half of the resentment? Like, is that the answer to resentment that we have to engage in? Aspects of recognition and acknowledgement of people's situation? Is that what people are looking for? Is that the answer to this politically to start having conversations? We want a definitive yeah. answer. Yeah. answer. <laughs> I, yeah. I mean, what is Portico? The work you're doing with Portico, I'd love to have you think about these kinds of Well, I do, I do think, I mean, a lot of times I would say when Democratic Party when Democratic Party organizers, people on the left, if I'm giving a talk or something, they say, "What does what do they want? What do, what do rural folks in Wisconsin want?" And my answer is generally respect. They it's not a partic particular policy area. It's they generally, like Mike was saying earlier, they they're not enamored of either party generally. Um, but what they want is to know that they're that they're being recognized, that their concerns are heard and acted upon. And, you know, that's generally what most people want, I think, <laughs> and and what's lacking generally in the United States. So that's why you see resentment in, in a variety of forms. It's not just in rural Wisconsin, certainly, right? Um, it's in many, many places. So, yes. In, in, what, in the cortic can you talk just briefly about the cortical work you're doing, where you're trying to get people to hear perspectives from other people? Does that help? Does that well, help with recognition, or do you think, or just help them understand what at least other people's perspectives are on that issue? Yeah. It, well, it's a little too soon to tell, but I would say so. The work I'm doing with this um, nonprofit cortical, it's aligned with a, a lab at the Media Lab, MIT Media Lab, um, um, called the Center for Constructive Communication, and um, the most probably the most promising work we've done is around uh, listening to folks across Boston um, around the mayoral race, and that was sort of used as a way to ask questions of the candidates in the general election in in that mayoral race, which was just last year. So it's a little too soon to tell like how it actually impacts governing and therefore impacts people's perceptions of or feelings about being governed. We also used it here in Madison to, to help select the police chief. They're too, a little too soon to know, but um, I, I don't, I, part of me feels like um, it's very promising and yet naive on a level, right? Because the changes that need to be made in the United States system of government, whether we're talking local or national, are quite extreme and they're because the voices ultimately the people who are listened to are people who are um, holders of wealth and simply listening to people and and it, it requires to actually make people feel heard needs a fundamental shift in how we do economic policy and so I don't mean to overstate <laughs> what listening can achieve but um, it can, at a minimum, illuminate who is not being listened to. Because when you do actually listen to members of the public in a, in a way that's transparent, um, it's more easy to see the people in power are not actually responding to those concerns. Yeah. Just yell, Steph. Oh, this idea of recognition pausing, waiting, waiting. All right. Hello, live stream. Um, <laughs> so for me, frightening flow up there was, you know, Twitter and the news media listening to elites on Twitter or ordinary people on Twitter. But as we all know, everybody on Twitter, hi, live stream, 
is crazy and and not <laughs> indifferent and you know weird, right? Hi Twitter. Um, and so when we listen to to Kathy talk about this project in Boston, um, I interpreted it from a journalism school as the value of journalists understanding what people are talking about. And that's where the line needs to come, right? Like we need a box that isn't like local conservative actors on Twitter. We need a box that's people in the community <laughs> that the news media is listening to. And so that for me is the, the listening and the recognition and the space that Twitter gets a disproportionate attention. And then we see because of journalistic routines and it's there and you're sourced and now I can write a story about it. But what's beautiful about Kathy's project is trying to create and datafy because let's be honest, that's what's needed for journalists, right? Is this is what people were talking about. This is what people said. This is a quote you can use. And that's what's really beautiful about that project. You know, I think that that makes me think about um, I'll take your, I guess I want to take your point one point further. So, so Stephanie was just talking, I think, really importantly and articulately about local reporters and, and journalists. And we know from another, I promise this is not a planned promotional tie-in, but <laughs> another Elements book, the one that Johanna Dunaway, Josh Darr, and Matthew Hitt wrote about Homestyle News, does this neat, like they, they take advantage of an experiment that a local newspaper did in California where they took all of the opinion pieces that were national opinion pieces out of their newspaper for a month. And Dunaway, Dar, and Hit, I'm not sure if I have the order right there, um, uh, did a pre post study of that community and then a neighboring community where that didn't happen. And they found that the people in that community became less polarized <laughs> by not seeing all the national opinion discourse in their local newspaper. But they also found the local paper didn't get any more diverse. They had a chance to fill the opinion pages with local voices, and they were the wealthy voices that Kathy was talking about. They weren't other ones. Uh -huh. And so I think it's kind of this interesting juxtaposition that's just, it's just a hard problem. I, I want to just point out that everything old is new again, or everything new is old again. <laughs> that the public journalism movement of the, of the yeah. 90s and two early 2000s did this, did this in some cases extraordinarily well, yep. convened community listening groups, Buzz, uh, uh, Buzz Merritt in Wichita, where Wichita yeah. and I actually met. Wichita uh, Star. Uh, cr they created a systematic way of listening to citizens, creating something called a citizen's agenda, asking questions of politicians that citizens wanted to know. And it was actually you know, trashed by elite journalists, but I think partly for that reason, because th they lost control of the voice. Mm -hmm. The voice was the voice of citizens. Now, it wasn't perfect, of course, but it was actually quite good. When it was done well, it was quite good, and it actually did make a difference. I studied four of those communities in depth, and it made a large difference in the not just the climate of opinion climate of those communities, but actually in policies around policing, uh, you know, some very large, significant local policies. And so we do have big experiments, again, from a slightly different time, that show that this really does work. And, you know, now we need, as you say, Steph, we need data, you know, to prove to journalists that this is, you know, that what they were hearing before they could trust if they heard it and now they need to see it in data form, okay, but yet this can work. We also need, I think, a way to tell local news organizations that it can work from a business perspective. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely, and that's just part of that. Did Sadie, did you have too. a question? Sadie, did you have a question? Well, I have a okay, let's 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 yeah, go ahead, go. Are you sure? Yeah, I mean, yeah, it kind of yeah. took a different turn. Please, 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 Sadie. Sadie. Okay. You're, a, you're an author on the book. You yeah. should yeah. definitely be featured. Okay, so, First of all, my kind of hesitation to answering the question off the cuff is I've been kind of thinking a little bit more about like what, what this politics of recognition looks like, what the consequences of it are. And Kathy talking about it kind of made me think of a few things that I do think are important to recognize, which is like, I think because of Trump, we think a lot about people who aren't being recognized as kind of like everything old is new again, the forgotten man <laughs> of like FDR, right? Like we're thinking of rural white people, but through our and also through like my own work on my dissertation, I've talked to a lot of other types of people too who feel like fundamentally misrecognized, specifically like young people and people of color also feel misrecognized and misrepresented or unrepresented. And I think one of the things that I'm struggling with that I think might be interesting for a later conversation is like, of course, recognizing people in the sense that Chris was talking about yesterday, like everybody deserves to be recognized as fully human, right? 
But what are the costs of like extending it beyond the people that Kathy or I are talking about and like some of the more extreme examples that came up in your presentation and other presentations? Like, what does it mean to recognize incels for all the things that they're talking? You know what I mean? Like, what are the potential costs of this like reframing of like our social problems as being solved by recognition? Because in some ways, a lot of these kind of traditional what uh, what did you call changing traditions kind of leading to the crises that Lou was talking about earlier and kind of this integration crisis is like sometimes things change in a good way <laughs> and it might create like is the problem the change itself or is the problem like the kind of recalibration of people to that change so I just think it adds another kind of like tricky layer for us to think about as we're thinking about these ideas. Great point, so just to, just to be clear, while the mic's moving, it's Bo. Uh, by no means am I, was I trying to oh, totally. un uncritically validate those, those traditions. Okay, now this is jumping from one thing to another. I was going to come a little bit back to the to the listening experiments and and the, and the public journalism stuff. Uh, I think there are two things there that are important when you think about what's going on this book and what's going on today. One is um, Perhaps one of the most difficult thing then and maybe still maybe there are data five ways in which we can do this was that that it was very laborsome you know to, you know like thirty years ago to say that let's uh, that we need an organized effort to listen to what uh, st uh, people are actually saying, and the other problem was that journalists were not very fond of it <laughs> because they thought you know um it's much more effective and much more important to listen to the people who actually have the power. And there's a lot to say about that, and it's it's true in a sense. So, But the other thing that is different today, I think, is that uh, 20 years ago or 30 years ago, uh, there was someone, who, the listening idea was that by listening, you would give an access to these voices to something that was fairly shared and common. Now, the communication infrastructure that you describe here, the, it, it, it begs the question, if we listen to what people are saying, uh, to whom are they talking to? Wh what's the forum where we, where we take their, their voices? And when, you, when, I <laughs> when I look at that, I'm not sure I want to take them there. Oh, yeah. And, and there's something tremendously uncoordinated about this and, and, and kind of scary in a sense. <laughs> Um, but but really really interesting. Uh, uh, but and about Twitter, I want to say this. Uh, I think it's increasingly uh, important to think uh, uh, that to think about it more as a sort of a uh, part of the mainstream media uh, polarization landscape. Uh, uh, and I don't think journalists even today think about it as the voice of the people. I don't, I don't think they do. I think it's just, it's part of the professional practice in the attention economy. They like it. They're on it. They're on it, of course. It's useful to them. It's useful to them, and, the, and they maybe sometimes use it as a kind of proxy of this is what people are saying. But I don't think they think that it's a way of surveying what's going on. Maybe they do. I think it's yeah. what's getting talked about, and yeah, I think it, I think you're yeah. encouraged to write stories that are going to be shared. Yeah, 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 but, but that, that's a different thing. I think they look at it to understand, uh, so, I mean, Chris's work on Trump and, and, and how when Trump would tweet and get retweeted, that journalists took that as a signal that what he was saying was important. Amplification in yeah, yeah, this yeah, environment, I think, yeah. certainly has served okay. as a signal for journalists. Shannon McGregor's work talking about how journalists rely on the voices of citizens as a way to surface ideas that sometimes reinforce their existing perspectives. Uh, 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 Zizwan who's here and CJ, we're just doing work on looking at bots mm -hmm. and how bots mm -hmm. that amplified certain uh, uh, COVID arguments uh, were picked up by journalists on the right and the left differently depending on whether it essentially amplified perspectives they wanted to talk about. Yeah. Right, so if the bots would amplify it, they go, oh, lots of people are thinking about this, they were more likely to write about it. Yeah. So I think they do take it as a signal, right? There is, whether they're looking at individual voices, a la Shannon McGregor saying, hey, I'm mm -hmm. going to use this and let them use it as a quote, or if they're using the metrics, I think they rely on it now. 
I, I think it's unavoidable. And I think this goes back to the question of how do we get real voices as citizens? Because the problem is Twitter isn't the real voices. Twitter is the most extreme voices. It's a battleground. We're talking about the title of the book. That's, that's, that's what that is, right? Yeah. That's where it is, right? I mean, compared to the kinds of discourses that Sadie was hearing from people, the kind of discourse that Kathy hears, they're much more nuanced. They're yeah, much yeah, more I've flavored with inflection and, and consideration of other perspectives. They're, they are Zalarian in that sense that there's a mix of considerations. That they, don't, they have a lot of ways of thinking about this. Mm. And, and I think that's the big difference. Emily, Emily, Chris, Chris, Chris wants to talk. Oh, was Chris talking about something? Yeah, no, Chris, oh, you have something to add? Please, 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 please. No, no, no. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Can I, may I just qualify? So I, I, think, I think there's a range. I think if you talk to the journalists I've talked to, <coughs> there's a range of things. But the thing, one thing to recognize is the attention economy below this. Because for so many of those journalists, especially in online publications, they're constricted in such a way that they're producing a ton of stuff. And there's no way you can go and get uh, a, a man on the street interview. So the Twitter is the place to, to grab the thing, which goes back again to the possible value of something that is much more credible, uh, but also fast and easy access. It also leads to problems like Joe Lucchito has outlined, where suddenly Russian misinformation agents work their way into our news because they seem credible. That's a credible source, right? And it's actually completely a concocted account because they haven't gone and actually found the real person behind it. Um, so thank you. And I wanted to say I watched you on the live stream. You looked great. Um, <laughs> so then I ran over here to ask a question. Um, Mike cool. kind of ended by asking what what happens next. And I want to turn it back to you and hear about that. Because one thing that I think is really important about the book is the focus on a battleground state in national elections. But the nationalization of elections, of course, has its own flaws. And I think that speaks to Lou's earlier point about relationships are still very much local, media not so much. So how do we do this? How do we apply these lessons or take this data or get new data to think about how these questions work when we're thinking outside of national politics? Yeah, sure, throw me that. <laughs> <laughs> I answer uh, the easy ones, yeah, man. I, I throw the hard ones to you. I know. Um, <laughs> no, um, you know, as you can imagine, Emily, I don't know, <laughs> is the short, for the first short and honest answer. Um, but, but, I, I mean, I, I've been in, since I've retired, just to be clear, um, I've been in s conversation with some people who are trying, people primarily, not, not super left progressives, but people in that wing of things who are trying to understand, you know, what, what, you know, asking themselves, what can, what can we do about you know, misinformation in not just rural areas, but in, you know, uh, you know, many places. And some of those folks want to build up, as, you know, and whether this could be done or not is a whole other set of questions. I doubt it personally. A kind of, you know, progressive Fox News type operation in, in, more, in more localities, right? And it, this is sort of being done. I've been skeptical of that because I actually think both normatively and actually to effectively begin to lower the temperature, which I happen to think benefits civil society in general and ironically the pro pro process of social reform as well, that people actually need access to more mainstream media, ideally more localized, because that's what creates the cross-cutting uh, opinion. Now, even though, as you know, Devana said, uh, we, you see, we know that you know, opinion environments matter, and in fact, they can affect people's opinions. But doing the opposite is much harder. So, to go back to my talk earlier, rebuilding civil society is much harder than destroying civil society. And as disintegration begins, you know, by which I don't mean falling apart for those who went there, but but the pulling apart of different groups from each other, as, as, as that begins to gain a certain velocity, reweaving that normative, you know, broadly, I don't mean, I don't mean normative my side, but literally the sense of common, commonality, common ground on which people can engage in policy and other disputes and debates, that's extremely hard to do. But I'm, I'm increasingly convinced that some neutral, 
diaspora that can be trusted by multiple sides and multiple groups is essential. So that's not very hopeful because it's going to be very extremely hard given the transformation, particularly of the newspaper ecology, its oligopolization, monopolization, effective monopolization, uh, uh, the difficulty as new news forms emerge locally, they're often digital because for any number of reasons, that's where the that's where the traffic is, right? For in an attention economy, you need to be digital because you can't make your money selling display ads anymore. So therefore, you're digitizing, which is to say also uh, polarizing the local discourse at the same time that you're re reinventing local news. So that's not a very hopeful response, but it is a sense of, I think you're right, but the puzzle is extremely difficult. And when you begin, Aaron said this a few minutes ago, when you begin to think about this from the standpoint not simply of institution building, but business models, it becomes even more complicated because the business model that works now is, if you will, uh, anti-civil, for lack of a better word. That's a little bit strong, but it, it mitigates against uh, uh, the re rebuilding or reconstruction of civil society. And so, I don't know, <laughs> uh, but I do think, I think I know what needs to happen. I don't know what form it needs to happen in, and I don't, certainly don't know how institutionally that's going to be accomplished. So I'll take one quick stab at your yeah, question too, uh, Emily, and that is hopefully where I think we take this next, especially given the three cases. I think there's some hope in the <coughs> cases around immigration and healthcare about what's happening conversationally that's, that, that's protecting people against the flows of information that they were, and it's not that there wasn't a lot of healthcare information, there was a ton of it, right? But compare it to Foxconn, where there's just massive flows of information and shaping of social and, and, and social media discourse by news, right, and vice versa. That to me is, to me, to me unpacking what's happening in spaces where actual conversations among citizens seems to help them guard themselves against certain kinds of influence I think is one place that we have to start unpacking. So we haven't done that yet. We've looked at the flows and we've looked at opinion, but we have not brought them together as completely as we could or tried to unpack why is it that these issues differ so much, right? So I think we've started at highlighting, wow, Foxconn, when you construct an issue out of thin air and you control the discourse and the president's on your side, wow, you can really shape and move people's opinions. With issues like healthcare and immigration, I think we need to unpack what's going on there more to understand what is it within those issues and within how Democrats talk about them, how people experience them, why people think in a state like Wisconsin, which is not a border state, not a southern border state, northern border state, it's we have coming. very sympathetic attitudes towards immigration. In fact, if you looked at, in the back of the book, we have overtime trends. Even in the rural areas, they're supportive of immigration the entire time. More supportive than urban areas. Yeah, in some cases. It's, it's, it's astounding. So we have to unpack these questions. I mean, there's so many layers in here. But I think there's answers partly about how Democratic elites are very unsuccessful at responding to a lot of discourses compared to Republican elites. And frankly, I think we're losing the culture war along those very lines if you are someone who's on the Democratic side compared to the Republican side because of their ability to concoct issues and push discourse and be really unified. Part of what we also saw with Foxconn, it was a concerted effort. It was Walker, it was Trump, it was everyone working in tandem, including the conservative Twitter stream. The, the others and the other side of that though and just to the ho a, a hopeful note as Foxconn <coughs> began to di you know vaporize basically and it became relatively clear fairly quickly that it, this was if I may no I'm not going to use that word that it was relatively <laughs> clear quickly that this was not going to happen it was certainly nowhere remotely near the scale proportionate to the giant tax breaks people were Disaffected, and even Republican, you know, Sadie interviewed a number of Republican business people. I think there are uh, most of them, you know, saying, you know, yeah, yeah, I'm for Walker, so yeah, this is good for the state, but hey, it's not really because it's not going to help me, and it's going to make the workforce problems even harder. And you know, when you the moment that they disattached their ideological affiliation and brought it back to their life world, even as businessmen, they said, yeah, this is BS. But hey, but our guys are for it, so we're for it. But we know this is, you know, ridiculous amount of money to spend on something that's not ever likely to show up. 
And even if it does, it's going to exacerbate labor problems. You know, so people had, well, you know, at the base understood many of both the issues and the consequences. It's just that they said, okay, but you know, my team says this. So okay, I'm I'm for it. And strong signals from the team, right? You got yeah. Walker, you got Trump, just yeah. Well, you yeah, you knew where, you knew where you were. Yeah, and you, unlike on the left, where you had Tammy Baldwin in the state, right? One big elite voice. You know, obviously, other when we talk about those other liberal elites, it's about 250. They're activists. There's political leaders. There's media figures. We're trying to cover a lot of ground, but. When you talk about that national one elite compared to what was on the right, I mean, so much more political power just in terms of followers, in terms of ability to get message out. And frankly, Tammy Baldwin is not active on social media. She has a very limited presence compared to a lot of political figures. Right? Yeah, she's when the style is different. It's, her it's, style it's, it's is much, much more, more traditional ground. credit claiming congressional behavior. And, yeah. and she does yeah. a lot more visits to like every county in the state. Yeah. So she's much more on the ground. Which, like, which, of course, itself is a contrast because instead yeah. of spending her time on in Twitter fights, yeah. She's visiting counties, and she, as a, as a pretty arguably liberal figure, gets reelected with healthy, healthy margins yeah. just by showing up. Yeah. And this goes to, you know, what Kathy said too. You know, she, every people in seventy-two counties know who Tammy is. She's been there, That's and right. so you know the fact that you know she's being demonized as you know, the devil tool of, a, of Alexandria Crazy Cortez. People still go, you know, she stands up for farmers, and I'm a farmer, so. That's what they hear. One thing I wanted to say in response to Emily's question, I, th I think I'm answering it if I'm remembering it, <laughs> um, because I, and I really liked it, was that um, I think w one place I think we should go from here involves anybody who wants to be a part of collaborating here is to think of us. We have, we have comparable data now across a bunch of different states, Wisconsin, Michigan, and Ohio, and Minnesota, and our part of the country, Pennsylvania, North Carolina, and Georgia, Georgia yeah. right? And so... What's similar and what's different across these states, across outcomes we care about, acro across media repertoires that we care about, across flows of information, conversationally, media, social media that we care about? Um, I think those are th places we should go. And then to throw cold water on that immediately, we need to work much harder as a set of scholars to think about, we, don't st we still don't know what people mean when they say the media. <laughs> or or the news and, and so I, I have a paper uh, for, uh, one of our alums and I have we just ask people what do you think wh what do you mean when you when you hear say the words the media there's not a there's, there's no 50 percent or more answer 40 percent of people if you give them if you open up a space and say tell us three things that come to mind 40 percent say CNN 40 percent of the country is not watching CNN many people say it but that's not what they use yeah. When we cue them to think about local media, all of a sudden they say local sources, their trust in the news goes up, and there's all these different things. And then you lay that on top of some stuff John Ng and I are working on to relate to the news desert kind of research. And we're finding that, first of all, folks in news deserts who are liberal grab lo national liberal sources. They're not looking for other local, they're not watching more local TV, they don't have a newspaper. Conservatives have already checked out of a lot of that and are, are already using more national conservative news and so there's an asymmetric effect for liberals but when you ask people in news deserts how much local newspapers they read they say the same amount as people who live in counties that have them what do they mean maybe they mean what nikki usher calls the goldilocks paper so i'm from a small town in minnesota if we lost our paper i would say my hometown paper is the minneapolis star tribune though i live two and a half hours from minneapolis right so so there's some of that happening it, that's not the kind of local news that's unifying and bringing a my small town of 11,000 together two and a half hours away from, you know, where the Timberwolves finally have a winning record, right? So, you know, it's, it's just very different to think about what do we mean by the news media and, and how do we come to understand that as we try to compare people's use of it on top of all of the other data that we've got. So, first of all, where do the Timberwolves have a winning record? But uh, now, uh, right, but now. Yeah. right now. They're Playoffs were held okay, today. Okay, okay. <laughs> but but I, I want to actually use this Emily's question in this general discussion as a plea, partly mm. going back to my talk, do the hard things. And I understand that, you know, there's untenured people in this room, there's graduate students in this room, there's, there's well-established associate professors in this room. <laughs> this, this data set could be used to explore these hard questions. Too much time in our field is spent doing minor variations and replication studies of things that we basically already know. Again, I understand what drives that from a job tenure standpoint. I'm not criticizing it at an individual level. 
but for the field to advance, this data set gives people an opportunity. So if you use our data set, and I hope that you do, do the hard things, ask these kinds of hard questions, and you can you know, use the data that we've already gathered to piggyback and maybe get a little bit deeper, get to some new issues and move, you know, move, move the field forward a bit. I'll just echo that and say it, the data is open, right? I mean, we want people to use yeah, it, absolutely, and we want you to critique what we've done. We don't think we have the answers here. Right? What we think we've done is opened up a puzzle that demands deeper exploration. And I think the questions that people have raised are spot on. Is it that people are gravitating towards media that they that they like, and are we seeing effects? Are we seeing kind of self-selection, right? Uh, what's happening at the local level that could challenge nationalization of media? And what evidence do we have that people are actually able to guard themselves against that? What about asymmetry, which we haven't talked a lot about, but yeah. it's all throughout what we're seeing here. Like certain issues are just owned and tend to be dominated by certain parties. And the ability even among the public of the asymmetric reactions. I think these are all questions that we need to unpack a lot more deeply. And hard data hopefully helps you do that, but not just this data. Hopefully it provokes you to look at other data sets and ask those same questions. Melissa had a question. I was going to say something, if that's okay. Yeah, please go ahead. Okay. Um, so I just wanted to say something in terms of, like, next steps and, like, doing the hard stuff and using our data and our methods. Um, so one of the things that I think is really cool that we do is I worked really closely with, with Joe in developing these conventional discourse dictionaries. And one of the really cool things about conventional discourses is, is like, so Mike was unpacking what do people even mean when they say the newspaper or the media. Also, like, what is public opinion and what does it actually look like in action? And public opinion scholars know all too well that people are full of contradictions, but I feel like the way that conventional discourses are so small, it lends them really well to being used to analyze what people say they believe in while allowing space for contradictions to kind of flourish. So I think it would be really cool for more people to kind of pick up that method Think about all the ways you could kind of trace the, these discourses to kind of further expand on this idea of discursive power across these different fields and issues. Yeah, it's obviously a bit more messy <laughs> to kind of do it that way, but I think it's really cool and promising. And 250 in-depth interviews with people throughout the state representing different occupations, genders, races, levels of elite you know, uh, experience, it's an insane qualitative data set that demands deeper exploration. Okay, so this is a, a less than half formulated thought, um, but I'll, I'll put it out there. And and it actually does uh, piggyback well off of Sadie's comment. So uh, I'm glad that, that you stuck with it and, and didn't let me intervene. Um, but I was thinking back to, to Lou, what, what you were saying about the, the contradiction between um, people taking cues maybe from their party, um, but not really thinking that way when it comes to how it affects themselves. So like if you take this meaning centered approach and you interpret things kind of based on your own projects and what you're going through, you come up with something different. And so I'm feeling these tensions between social identity and individual identity and thinking about how going back to um, the figures that you put up showing those seemingly powerful relationships between media and, and public opinion, and also that mainstreaming effect is that media is operating at that social identity level. So does that mean that, that people experience more dissonance if they go against a social identity than if they go against their own individual identity? Um, and, and I don't know that that's something that can be answered with the data. I guess if you go back to the interviews, Maybe, probably not, but it, it's just a thought that was formulating in my head. And I, think a lot, I think a lot of that has to do with also the relative context of expression, too. You know, if I'm saying something to, in my identity circle, if you will, or then I think actually in some ways you can, I mean, this is speculative, totally speculative, just to be clear. People can feel freer to say, you know, it, within, I, I know within my own ethnic group, it's much easier to say, oh, you know, to be critical and make fun of and all the, you know, you, if you're secure in your own identity group, you're going to be much more likely to engage in in-group talk, which is actually going to be quite critical of the group of the identity versus the, the more you, 
the more expo the more public it becomes and the more therefore open to misrecognition it becomes, the less likely you are to express identity in other than relatively more, if you will, guarded ways. I, I'm not sure that that works its way out uh, mm -hmm. through these other dimensions of media, but my gut sense is that it does. And so, uh, you know, I, and this gets the, the recognition problem too. But, uh, you know, where is, how, where is identity slash, and Aaron's question too, which is a very good one, I'm thinking more about it, this relation to identity and recognition, where are these, how are these two dimensions formed? How do these contexts form differently? Where are they contested? You know, are those are just big questions and I don't think we have good ways of answering them yet. We have some, I mean, qualitative ways are good ways of answering them or addressing them. And I think we need to do more of that, but uh, operationalizing them is very difficult, but I think, I hope possible. I want to put Chris on the spot yeah. with this. So what what your question made me think of is in an old an older paper that we published, one of the things we thought about along the way. So as as always happens, um, Lou makes a really important large point, and my mind goes to what's a half or maybe three quarter ways <laughs> asked way of measuring that, right? <laughs> and so you know. Um, we had that, remember the political outsider variable we tried to, like, yep. you know, so your own identity and who you think of yourself as, and then we tried to develop a way of measuring, I think this is the Stop Talking paper, about like how how far away are you oh, yeah. from the dominant, I think we might have said yes. like the yes. county yes. vote for, but like, right. I think that's related to this, but I want to, I'm curious what, you know. Okay, yeah. No, I want to put you on the spot. Yeah, well, I'm trying to reel through that a second. Um, I'm going to let you think about that, uh, 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 just to, just to Melissa's question, as you think about that, yeah. that I think the other thing that Mike brought up where people who are suburban actually relate more or identify more with, say, rural areas would be an interesting test of that. Like, where people have a certain place of residence, they have a localized identity, but they relate more to something else would be really interesting to start to examine that question. But I'm sorry, go ahead, Mike. Yeah, so I think there's a couple of thoughts. So one, one is Mike's point, I'm now remembering those, those findings, uh, and so that was a distinction between an individual's I mean, identity is, is such a difficult concept because it's, uh, it's, it's, it's hard for us to assign it externally, right? It's about how <laughs> you feel yourself to be. But in this place, we had people who had characteristics that were out of sync with their immediate environment. So to speak to this, so that it was, uh, uh, it was conservatives in places that had voted mostly Democratic and the reverse, we found were at, at subject, increased, more, more subject to stop talking. Mm -hmm. And the same thing with some labor issues if you were based on unions and, and non unions sure. kind of stuff, yeah. yeah. Um, so I think, uh, I think we're, we're able to look at that level a little bit. Um, the, the, I the problem with identity, the, there is an identity problem though, which is um, the social and the individual identities are, are merged in, in difficult ways. Like you are, you are your identity. So the I issue might, the really salient issue might be which of your particular identities is called out in a, by a particular issue or by a particular form of communication or as Lou was saying, in a particular circumstance where certain kinds of discourses are comfortable or not comfortable. Um, so I guess I'll leave it there. I think uh, Letitia was gonna follow. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's hard to tell without, with like I saw, heard sound, but didn't see. Lip I heard <laughs> sound. <laughs> I made sound. Um, I was just saying that's related to Emily Van Doyne's book, uh, oh, Democracy yeah. Lives in Darkness, which yeah. is all about people that are out of sync with their community politically. Yep. I think Earl Wyatt's dog too. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. Any other questions? We're about, good. Uh, Risto's got another one over here. I, I just want to tie back to something that um, that Sadie talked about a couple of, uh, of comments ago about whose recognition is deemed important. Yep. Um, and this ties as well to the, the question that was asked to Kathy and to the specific way in which she responded to that question. Um, there's, if you're familiar with um, political scientist Scott Lemieux, who's a, a blogger and on Twitter, he cites an adage a lot that he calls Merck's Law, uh, named after a commenter who, who pointed this out which is uh, the observation that in American political discourse, only Democrats have agency. <laughs> and I, I think this is something that we see a lot in the press, right? I mean, the, the, the Trump diner safari is we as journalists, but part of the liberal establishment, don't understand them, right? <laughs> we're othering them and we're concerned about their lack of recognition. Um, but to Sadie's point, there's a lot of other people unrecognized whose recognition our discourse is not concerned with, right? And 
when the question was posed to Kathy, what do rural people want? Rural people being privileged, right? What do they want from the Democratic Party? Yeah. The Democrats having agency. Why are Republicans not attracting younger voters, right? I mean, this, this has to be a part of our Minority discussion voters. of this as well, I think, in, particularly in the context of Republican attacks on democracy, right? I mean, I, I don't think we can come at this and say, Democrats need to find ways to reach these people who they're not reaching, that this is the core problem, right? There are a lot of people who are not being reached by one party or by both parties, that the lack of recognition exists across wide spectrums of identity. And who we talk about and who we privilege is, it's at the core of what the outcomes of these things are, right? You talked yesterday, Devon, about interventions yeah. and what we get out of projects like this and, and any, any other subsequent projects, any related projects, to the extent that there are interventions to be made, they're built on those normative questions, right? And, and I think it's something that we, we really need to keep in mind that the fact that all of us, I think, as in one sense or another, small L liberals, uh, I think we have this urge in some part to feel like this is something that we need to understand there's this thing that we don't get that we're not part of that we need to understand as academics and to the extent that we interface with journalists. Um, but that's not it, right? I mean, we, we've got to, I think, take this entire picture into account. We have to keep it in context of the fact that um, the people who are in the thick line part of this graph yep. are working to undermine or, or to avoid the reasons why their side does not need to worry about attracting anybody or recognizing anybody. That's a good right? point. I, and, and your point, I mean, I, I will never forget the phrase you just used, diner safari, which I think <laughs> is, um, I mean, again, I think is we did in the, in the aftermath of 2016, there was a certain set of voices privileged. And I think we still feel the lingering effects of that. And after 2020 as well. Oh, absolutely. Right? I mean, the, Went the back to them and said, why are now you're... The story of 2020 is just how did Democrats lose the elections that they won? Exactly. <laughs> yeah. And, 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 and I think to Sadie's point, I think it's, you know, it's absolutely critical for us. And I think Chris would say that this is part of the framework he's trying to develop and that Lu Lu he and Lou are trying to develop, that recognition cuts in every direction, right? Lots of groups want recognition. It's interesting, the other flip side of that is which political parties tend to care about recognition, right? Which ones engage in that work of care, right? And if it's asymmetric there too, then it's a one-sided political project. And that becomes challenging, right? I mean, like, you, it, it's, a, it's a question of all these different groups want it, but if only one group cares to deliver it, I don't know how that it's, becomes it's a it's solution. It's pluralism. I would That's just, right. Just, uh, just to, it, our framework and the Haas framework, to be clear, includes misrecognition. And right. misrecognition is not simply my misperception of how you, under, you recognize me. It can also, there can also be misrecognition of warfare, if you will. Look at how they yeah. see you, yeah. which is itself a, a kind of specific tool of creating systematic misrecognition across an entire political domain. And so that's part of the equation. It's, I think that's another It's, it's also, I think, a difficulty for the, the type of thing that, that Kathy was talking about, where to whatever extent <coughs> journalists or the establishment or Democrats or whoever properly recognizes a certain group of people, if there's a media establishment out there to say, regardless, you're being misrecognized. Sure. Yes. It's, it's not a vacuum that that recognition is being included in. Sure. That's right. That's a very good point. And if I can respond, and Sadie's also, I didn't respond immediately because I, I was taking a moment to uh, think about it. Um, it's a critical question about we can't just hand out recognition to everybody because there may be folks that we normatively don't want to, to recognize. Um, but I, the, the part of the value of the framework is that there's sort of multiple forms of recognition that you can look at here. And one of them is really perceptual, which is why do people feel the way that they do? Um, and this is an empirical reality. This isn't about how we want the recognition order to be. This is the fact that in our particular moment, the defining feature of our political culture is that everybody feels misrecognized. Now, where does that come from? Is it from people's lived experiences, uh, their, their storefronts and their interactions with others? Or what role do media, including allied media and opposing media, play in shaping their perceptions of recognition? And then how does it drive their behaviors? 
So I think that's one important answer to the question of why should we care about recognition when there are clearly groups that we don't have that much interest in, in recognizing. Um, one other response to Aaron, I think there's an ace, I do think there's an asymmetry between the parties. Uh, I understand the impulse to say the Democrats, why the Democrats are trying to mobilize this group, why can the Republicans not draw on the young people? I think that's true, but, but we have an, a, a deep asymmetry in our parties. We have a party right now that is more anti-democratic than virtually any party in our history, like explicitly anti-democratic. So part of the mystery is what is this recognition order that enables 49% of the country to support a country, a, a party that is explicitly anti-democratic. To me, that's a greater mystery than why the Republicans can't attract young people. Uh, and it's one that is, is, in a pragmatic sense, really important to try to answer. Should we give our keynote speaker the last question? Yeah, okay. Thank you, I was, I was, I was, uh, I was almost, almost thrown in. Um, um, okay, I had a, I had a simple question. Uh, you know, I just flew over uh, Atlantic to ask this question, <laughs> um, and it's this. Uh, uh, I mean, it's 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 a wonderful piece of work, and and, and as you've be outlined, and anybody who reads the book thinks that 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 you maybe use one point five percent of the data. Uh, and and it's the, the the systematic collection of 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 evidence is just you know mind-boggling. Uh, but what I think is really important to, uh, in 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 the book is the in a, in another sense than the fate of American democracy, which is a crucial thing for everybody in the world. Uh, but but what is uh, interesting in the, and important in the book is is the attempt to to model something. The, the, the sort of political communication ecology more in a more complex way. But I have a kind of a devil's advocate question here, and it's this. You talk about political communication model, and you kind of situate it into a uh, context of a political system too, but fairly little you actually talk about the power of the political system and the specific characteristics of American democracy and how it shapes what you find here. And I asked, I, I put this just because uh, uh, if you look at this from a point of view of, you know, I come from a small country about the size of Wisconsin, uh, where uh, we've never had a party that would have had a majority in the parliament. And we usually have about five, six or seven parties, uh, and, and then and, and, and a long tradition of coalition governments and, and, and different kind of uh, administrative culture and what have you. All the things that you can find if you, if you are forced to read Hallin and Mancini, <laughs> as many of us have been. And I'm wondering, because you have this uh, model from Germany as, as, uh, or this idea from Germany as the key, as the sort of um, reference point for the discursive power. So uh, what would you say, what is the, how much of the findings of the, the your, your communication political are actually reflections of the political system? Uh, and and to, to continue from there, when you talk about, I understand you want to compare between swing states. There are obvious political stakes here and, and, and so, but wouldn't it be if we raise the sort of political theory, communication, uh, stakes a little bit more. Wouldn't it be important to compare this and try to replicate something like this uh, in a political environment where the political structure that actually the discourse is somewhat different? So, first of all, Chris made me cut out those pages because we were already way too long. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, seriously. As always, it's Chris's fault. <laughs> That's what I was trying to say. Um, no, no, it's this a great question. And, and, and of course, the political system is is a primary shaper of political discourse. We we did ha we really did have I don't know pages on this that just had to go in this in this book, and I don't know what will ever happen to them. I'm 
and not ever want to see them again. But um, uh, no, seriously. But the, but to your point, we do have some experiments in this country, minimal, limited though they are, in Maine and in Alaska, with ranked choice voting. So you could in fact do a kind of internal states to states, quite not quite apples to apples, Maine to Wis to Wisconsin or Alaska to Wisconsin, but when the when the temperature of the political system or the degree of partisan contest, if if in fact this holds, but it appears to be true, that the degree of partisan contestation is uh, uh, reduced by a the actual political system, for example, the introduction of ranked choice voting, does that then um, change the degree of partisanship either in the media ecology or the way the media ecology reflects partisanship? It's a great question. And that, of course, does suggest uh, at some level possibly cross-national comparisons. And the only thing I would say about that is that uh, uh, we really did choose states as units for at least two reasons. Well, one is obvious that we live in the United States and that states make states have huge consequences here. Um, the other, of course, and we, you and I talked about this, is that is that you know we, we are a state of five million. <laughs> you know, Finland's a country of you know it's roughly comparable. But this is, we can do, we could model a whole ecology in a single space. And that was a major part of this model, which gets, it's not lost, but we, we say it certainly, but, but we said we want a large unit that is sufficiently rich, deep, heterogeneous, that we can take at least all the elements and put them in one place and attempt to see how they interrelate and interact. That said, part of comparativism is to then draw general conclusions from that and compare to other like and unlike units. So how you would do that, I think within the states is a critical question. And maybe you're pointing towards a Alaska comparison, for example, or a Maine comparison. Um, uh, is this my screen again? No, uh, <laughs> Maine comparison. And, uh, but how would you do it? I don't know, and I'm not sure how you do it cross-nationally. Well, what, what, I, what I meant was uh, that not, not comparative in national states, but, but comparative in a sort of maybe slightly more sort of level of findings uh, and, and, and sort of thematic comparisons, perhaps, because there's a lot of here in the book that, that, that reminds me of things that happen in Europe. Yeah. Issue ownership... Uh, uh, is, uh, and things like this that are sort of global structures of of political discourse, uh, maybe not as dramatic as they might be here, but, but very similar things that that sort of point that there are drivers outside these ecologies that actually produce these tensions, uh, that, and some of them are uh, you know uh, things that. Uh, all democracies in the Western world are facing uh, to a lesser or, or, or larger degrees, and they're sort of outside political system uh, uh, inputs that are that are causing these problems. Uh, but I'm thinking that, that that maybe there's if you if we think about this as a sort of democracy and political communication problem, maybe comparison we would have different kinds of democracies, different kinds of different kinds. Of Civic epistemology histories, what have you, would be would be a way of uh, uh, of developing the sort of theoretical agenda that you were talking about I, I before. Agree, I agree yeah. with you completely. I think the, the the framework we're bringing that's comparative in this respect is inside the U.S. Right, we're yeah, trying yeah, to compare yeah. different states, and so Mike and Jordan Foley, his student, have done work looking at different state level election laws and the implications of those for say time to the polls, things like that. So mm -hmm. looking at state structures that may shape some of these processes. I think comparative, when you talk about comparative, like taking the same approach and looking at it in a European context, I think it's applicable. Uh, you mentioned the German scholars, Andreas Junger, mm -hmm. and I think the work he's doing on discursive power and the ways he's examining it reflect the same approaches we're taking, yeah. right? So to me, 
we drew a lot of insight from those European scholars because we we actively pulled them into Frank Esser and Span oh, and, and Andres were all here. We had all these people ago. here actually informing the way we were thinking about this. So we were drawing on their thinking and ideas sure as we were know. formulating what we thought was happening in the state. So ideally this is a theory and I think, you know, again, a lot of what Lou is referencing is continental European <laughs> sociological theory. I mean it's coming the frameworks are coming from that 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 perspective too. So I would hope it's generalizable. The question is, how much do the structures shape this, and how much, how different would this be in different so social governmental contexts? That's an open question, right? I think in a parliamentary system where it's not winner take all, where you don't have this kind of contentiousness, you may have a very different set of outcomes, right, compared to the U.S. system where it's become heavily contentious because of the structure. But do we see populism and polarization in other countries too? Absolutely. To the same extent, uh, that's a question. Yeah, I, I yeah, I, there are very few laws in the social sciences, but Duvages is one of them. And <laughs> <laughs> I think that's yeah, yeah. I mean, I think thinking about comparing political systems is a really important idea, and and you can think about how just over the last ten or twelve years, like this, like it's always the like I've o we always see Silvio uh, Weisbord well, show us the the, the you know yeah. the top journals and what country's getting studied, right? Yeah, you know, hey, there's a hegemon there that gets studied more than anything else, right? Yeah. And so, but you know, as as we've seen more and more work come out of, especially like the Netherlands and other, we're, we're seeing lots of findings are very similar, in yep. terms of competing partisan sourced frames and how important issues are to people and whether they're persuasive or not and how they influence party identity versus issue preference. So a lot of that stuff translates across system and continents and all those sorts of things. But other stuff are just structured by. Up the political system in ways that I think are going to be really different, and so th I think it's a really important project. It and and, yeah. and just a la just a one final note, which is that when we really did have some generalizations about the U.S. political system in states that we had to basically pick out, partly because this, when you try to, we really did want to model. S we we wanted to model a political communication ecology, which is not simply political communication but the interaction of the political system and the communication system, and we had to essentially put, other than this sort of outline in the barest terms, the political system side of that, obviously because it's very hard to do that kind of system-to-system -system work in our academic division of labor. It's a, well, in any division of labor, it's just hard because it's two whole, modeling two whole systems and then their intersection. But yet, I think that it's part of what we need to do, and sort of what part of what I was trying to point to in that earlier talk, too. So, Risto, great last question. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you all for great feedback, comments, ways of thinking about this. We really appreciate it. We look forward to what's next. Exactly. We get to have a very nice set of conversations that follow this, but then also a dinner where we get to continue these conversations. So thanks, everyone who joined us virtually. Thank you, those who are in the room who made such great give us such great feedback and we just want to keep the conversation going so it doesn't end now but the live stream does bye folks <laughs> bye,